The main question we'll be discussing is the following. If we know the field in one plane, how will the field propagate to another plane? This may, for example, be useful in photolithography. If we want to print the pattern from a mask onto a photoresist, then the pattern we see on the resist is not exactly the same as the pattern we see on the mask, because the field is changing as it propagates. In order to address this question, we first need to become familiar with plane waves, and the simplest way to do that is to start with one-dimensional waves. From there, we can explore the more relevant 2D and 3D waves. After introducing complex notation, which is a more convenient way to describe fields, we'll discuss the angular spectrum method, where a field is propagated by decomposing it into plane waves and propagating each plane wave separately. One result that follows from this is the evanescent field, which has consequences for the maximum resolution of imaging systems. Let's start with one-dimensional plane waves. This wave can be written as cosine kx minus omega t, where x denotes position and t denotes time. We've plotted the wave for a fixed time t is equal to zero, and we can see that the function has a certain wavelength lambda. However, our equation for the wave doesn't contain any lambda explicitly. So how can we relate k to lambda? To answer that question, we must first ask, what do we mean when we say a function has a wavelength lambda? We mean that the function is periodic in space with period lambda. So for any point x, the field is the same as an x plus lambda. This has to be true for any point in time t. In particular, it has to be true for x is equal to 0 and t is equal to 0. If we put x equals 0 and t equals 0 in our expression for u, we get the equation 1 equals cosine k lambda. The smallest solution larger than 0 to this equation is k lambda equals 2 pi, from which it follows that k is equal to 2 pi over lambda. k is called the wave number, and one can intuitively interpret it as the number that converts distance to phase. For example, when multiplying k with some distance d, you essentially check how many times the wavelength lambda fits in d, and then you say that each wavelength corresponds to a phase shift of 2 pi meaning that the wave has gone through one period. The wave is also periodic in time, meaning that if we wait for a period of time capital T, we end up with the same situation. So the next question we can ask is, how are omega and the period capital T related? The reasoning is again the same. For any time T, the field should be the same at time T plus capital T for any position X. In particular, it should be the same for x is equal to 0 and t is equal to 0, which leads to the equation 1 is equal to cosine omega capital T. And the smallest solution larger than 0 is given by omega is equal to 2 pi divided by capital T. Omega is called the angular frequency, and just like k converts distance to phase, omega converts time intervals to phase. Multiplying omega by a time interval delta t checks how many periods capital T fit in delta t, and each period corresponds to a phase shift of 2 pi, meaning that the wave at any fixed point x has gone through one oscillation. If we focus on the point of the wave with the fixed phase, we see that it moves with a certain velocity. How does this velocity, which we call phase velocity, depend on the wave number k and the angular frequency omega? The phase of this plane wave is given by kx minus omega t. So, if we keep the phase fixed and vary the time t, we can write the position x as a function of t, and we can compute the phase velocity by taking the derivative of x with respect to t, and this will give c is equal to omega over k. Alternatively, we could come to the same conclusion by observing that over one period t, a point of fixed phase has moved by one wavelength lambda. So, the phase velocity is lambda over t, which one can rewrite as omega over k. So, to summarize, the wave number is given by k, which is equal to 2 pi over lambda, the angular frequency is given by omega, which is 2 pi over t, and the phase velocity c is given by omega over k. With this knowledge, we can now move on to 2D and 3D plane waves. To describe a 2D plane wave, we define a 2D wave vector k with components kx and ky, and we define a position vector x with components x and y. The wave is given by cosine k dot x minus omega t. For a certain wave vector k, we plot the field as a function of x and y and see how it changes in time. 
One question we can ask is, how does the wavelength lambda relate to the wave vector k? Just like in the one-dimensional case, we try to find the shortest x for which ux at time 0 is equal to u0 at time 0. This happens when k dot x is equal to 2 pi, and the shortest x for which that happens is x is equal to 2 pi times k over the modulus of k squared. The wavelength is then given by the length of this x, which is 2 pi over the modulus of k. Rearranging this gives that the modulus of k is equal to 2 pi over lambda. Our next question is, what do the wavefronts look like, and in which direction do they propagate? From the plot we can already guess the answer to that, but let's try to calculate it more rigorously. Like in the one-dimensional case, we choose a fixed phase phi which is equal to k dot x minus omega t. If we solve for x, we find that x is some factor parallel to k, but we can add any factor to it that is perpendicular to k, which means that the wavefronts are lines perpendicular to k. To calculate the velocity at which these wavefronts propagate, we take the time derivative of x and find that the wavefronts move parallel to k, with the speed of omega over the modulus of k. So to summarize, the length of the wave vector k is given by 2 pi over lambda. k indicates the direction of propagation of the wavefronts, and these wavefronts are perpendicular to k, and they move at the speed of omega over modulus k. For the three-dimensional case, we'll state the results which are analogous to the two-dimensional case without going through the mathematical derivation. The wave vector k now consists of three components kx, ky, kz, and the position vector x consists now of three coordinates x, y, z. The length of the wave vector is given by 2 pi over lambda. The wave fronts are planes that are perpendicular to k, and they propagate in the direction of k with a speed of omega over modulus k. We've spent lots of time discussing plane waves, but actually they are unphysical because they extend over an infinite region of space and oscillate infinitely long. So why do we even bother with them? This is because sometimes they serve as a good approximation to an actual field, but more importantly, they serve as the mathematically simple building blocks with which we can construct and understand more complicated realistic fields, as we will see later when discussing the angular spectrum method. However, before we do that, let's first introduce a more convenient way to describe time harmonic fields using complex notation. So far, we've discussed time harmonic plane waves, which are of the form cosine k dot x minus omega t. However, we can also consider time harmonic fields that are not plane waves. Such a field has an amplitude a and phase phi that depend on the position x. This field is still time harmonic because for each point x the field oscillates harmonically with the fixed angular frequency omega. Now suppose we consider such a field in two points x1 and x2. In each point the field oscillates with some period t, but how large is this t typically? We know that t is equal to lambda over c, where lambda is the wavelength of light and c is the speed of light. If lambda is 0.6 microns, which is orange light, then we see that one oscillation takes 2 times 10 to the power minus 15 seconds, which is much too short for any detector to detect. But even though the fields at these two points oscillate too fast to detect, their phase difference is always constant in time. Therefore, it makes sense to introduce some notation that gives the amplitude and phase of the field, but leaves out the time dependence. Complex numbers, which have an amplitude and phase, are therefore perfect for this. So let's denote the complex field as u of x, which has a of x as its amplitude and phi of x as its phase. Given this definition, we can ask the following question. How do we go from a complex field u of x to a real field u of x and t? The answer to that is that you multiply the complex field with e to the power minus i omega t to introduce the appropriate time dependence, after which you take the real part. Since plane waves are so important, another question you could ask is, how do you write a time harmonic plane wave in complex notation? The answer to that should be quite straightforward, namely e to the power i k dot x. By now, we've acquired the tools necessary to explain the angular spectrum method to propagate a time harmonic field. So let's recall our original problem. Given the field in a plane z is equal to zero, how will the field propagate to some other plane? Given that we know how time harmonic plane waves propagate, we can use the following scheme to propagate a field. 
We decompose the field in the plane Z is equal to zero into two-dimensional plane waves. Each plane wave is propagated separately to some plane Z zero. After propagating each plane wave, all the plane waves are added back together to find the total propagated field. Let's look at each step in more detail. We want to write the field in the plane Z is equal to zero as the sum of two-dimensional plane waves characterized by the spatial frequencies Fx and Fy. Each plane wave has a weight u hat zero and this function is called the angular spectrum of the field and one can see that u and u hat are related to each other by a two-dimensional spatial Fourier transform. Now how will we propagate each plane wave? We know that a three-dimensional plane wave is of the form e to the power i k dot x where the wave vector k has a fixed length that is determined by the wavelength. So we see that our two-dimensional plane wave describes our three-dimensional plane wave in the plane set is equal to zero if we substitute kxy with 2 pi fxy. The longitudinal component of the wave vector, kz, is then fixed up to its sign by the length of the wave vector k. The sign of kz is determined by whether the field propagates in the positive or negative z direction, which depends on whether the sources of the field are located before or after the plane set is equal to zero. This value for kz determines for each two-dimensional plane wave how it will propagate to any other plane. Now that we found how each plane wave propagates, we can add all the propagated plane waves together to find the total propagated field. So the initial field was decomposed into two-dimensional plane waves with spatial frequencies fx, fy, and each plane wave has a weight u hat zero, which is the angular spectrum of the field and found by Fourier transforming the field. To propagate the field to another plane z0, we include an extra phase term, which is essentially the kz component of a wave vector k with length 2 pi over lambda. We can write this expression differently using Fourier transforms. We Fourier transform the initial field to decompose it into plane waves, we multiply the spectrum with the phase term, and then we inverse Fourier transform the product to add all the waves together. Now let's look at a particular result of the angular spectrum method namely the existence of an evanescent field. To understand this field, let's look at the following questions. When is this part of the exponent real, and when is it imaginary? If it is imaginary, what happens to the complex exponential? And what does this result imply for the resolution with which u x y zero can be imaged? To answer the first question, this expression becomes imaginary when the term under the square root becomes negative, which happens when fx squared plus fy squared is greater than 1 over lambda squared. Otherwise, it is real. This equation describes a circle with a radius 1 over lambda, so we can identify a circle with radius 1 over lambda in frequency space, and for all the frequencies inside the circle, the expression is real, and for all the frequencies outside the circle, the expression becomes imaginary. Now the second question. When the expression becomes imaginary, the complex exponential becomes an exponential that decays as the propagation distance set increases. This means that all the spatial frequencies within the circle with radius 1 over lambda can propagate, whereas the spatial frequencies outside the circle decay exponentially as they propagate, hence the term evanescent field. And for the final question, how does this affect the resolution with which the field in the initial plane can be imaged? The higher spatial frequencies of that field are required to describe small details in that field, so they correspond to high resolution information. When this information is lost, the resolution of the field is limited, and this limit is determined by lambda, the wavelength of the illumination. We've seen that the evanescent field decays exponentially as it propagates, so therefore, if we have an imaging system where the field has to propagate for a distance that is significantly larger than the wavelength of the light, the imaging resolution will be limited by the wavelength of the illumination. This limit is called the diffraction limit. There are certain methods to achieve a resolution higher than the diffraction limit, which is called super-resolution. One of these methods is near-field optical scanning microscopy, where the field is probed so close to the sample that the evanescent field hasn't decayed yet. Other methods convert evanescent fields to propagating fields through interaction with some material, so that high-resolution information can still be detected far away. Another method to obtain super-resolution is to use prior information about the source. For example, if you know that your source is a point source, then you can accurately infer its position from its image, even if it is diffraction-limited. 
By activating point sources in your sample sequentially and localizing them using their diffraction-limited spots, you can obtain a super-resolution image of your sample.